Hey there, are you a strong, capable individual who is killing it in your professional life, but struggling to really connect and communicate well in your intimate relationship? Mm, I know the feeling. So does my guest today, relationship coach Sharon Costanzo. But she skillfully turned things around and now shares insights and tips to help partners create meaningful, satisfying relationships. Well, yeah. Welcome to the Perpetual Motion Podcast, an educational and inspirational program focusing on helping professionals communicate better, invest wisely, and excel in their careers with an emphasis on self-care, because that's where it all starts. Each week, I enjoy uplifting and often hilarious conversations with leading experts who span the globe. If you are as passionate about personal growth and changing the world for the better as I am, lean in, lean back, and join the journey. You can't say Dr. Mo ain't tell ya that fear magnifies the consequences of failure. What are you scared of? Why are you afraid? Rather live like I'm dying than live to die. Welcome, Sharon. Thanks so much for having me. I'm so excited to be here. As am I. You are a relationship coach and host of the Respected and Connected podcast, specializing in helping couples overcome communication barriers, work through conflict, and foster connection. But I want to know, what is your backstory? What is the motivation for this mission? Oh. I've been telling this story so much lately. And when people ask me, Oh, how do you, how did you become a relationship coach? What was your inspiration? And I was like, well, my marriage, of course. (laughs) And the, the failures and frustrations in my marriage, especially. So I, I've been married for about 12 years now, just over 12 years. Congratulations. (laughs) Yeah. We made it. We made it past the seven year itch. Thank goodness. But, and we have two, we have two young kids. Our kids are eight and nine. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, just to give a little bit of context, I live in Utah. There's a very strong influence from the Mormon church here in Utah, which is a very patriarchal culture, you know, kind of, you think about like male leadership, uh, men kind of being in charge in the home. That very traditional, you know, heteronormative idea of the man is the breadwinner, the woman is kind of overall everything in the home. That's the culture that I grew up in. But I also grew up kind of wanting to move past that culture, have a little bit more of my own identity, ambition. You know, I always did really well in school. I think I was kind of a feisty kid. (laughs) I was like, I am not going to be... Uh, I'm not going to be this submissive housewife. That was not my desired identity in life. And, uh, and, you know, now that I look back on it, I'm like, well, of course, growing up in this culture and wanting things to be different for me in my home, there were going to be some frustrations. And my husband and I got married a little bit later than most people in this area do get married. I was 27. He was 29. I had already had a career, had purchased my own home. I was pretty independent. And I felt like I made this big assumption that, you know, my husband, knowing who I was professionally, meant he was going to be more of kind of the partner in the home that I would have wanted him to be. And he just didn't grow up with that template of what that looked like. And I didn't grow up with the skills of how to advocate for myself and the kind of relationship that I really wanted. So the conflict really, you know, the story that I had at the time was he's, he's not willing, he's not capable, he's taking advantage of me. But now looking back that we've moved past it, I'm like, well, of course we would have this challenge giving the, the culture that we grew up in and, you know, the skills and insights and and mindsets that we each were missing. But we had, especially after kids, a lot of conflict about housework, childcare, investment in the relationship. 
just a lot of conflict. And I, being, you know, the stereotypical woman, was always the one kind of pressuring, asking for more, complaining, right. criticizing, and it was creating a lot of conflict in our marriage. Mm-hmm. And I wasn't really finding any useful support or insight on what to do about it. And things we weren't went, changing. Things weren't changing. All. And, you know, we had seen by the time we'd been married for six or seven years, we'd seen four or five couples therapists. Um, I remember, I mean, this is a story. This isn't a story I share always, but um, very early in our marriage, I think before we even had kids, uh, I I have a sewing hobby. That's kind of my my personal hobby. I love to sew and I do apparel sewing. And my husband really wanted me to make him a blazer. And I was like, I don't make blazers. Like, I don't make blazers. That's a huge effort. I didn't really want to do it. Mm-hmm. And he just kept pressuring, pressuring, pressuring. And I was going to individual therapy at the time. And my therapist said, well, tell him that sounds like a lot of work and you don't want to do it. You have enough work. I told him that. And he was like, well, that's messed up. He didn't use that word. He used a different word. But, you know, we kind of had been given this template of a woman should just be like always happy to love and serve and submit to her husband and, and give him whatever he wants. And and in return, what she would get is, you know, the affection and, and care that she wanted. And that just wasn't working for us. Mm-hmm. You know, there were things mm-hmm. that, that he expected of me that I didn't want to do. There were things that I expected from him as far as housework, childcare, emotional support that I mm-hmm. wasn't getting. And we weren't finding from the resources that we had a good way forward. And I was feeling really frustrated with when I would, when we would go to therapy, it was kind of like, well, Sharon, couldn't you be a little bit nicer? <laughs> and I'm like, who's telling him to, to step up and be more helpful? And how do we do this? And, So I really had, I felt like I was lost and I had to figure out a lot of that on my own. Mm, Makes sense. Yeah. And when I finally got through it and I was like, oh, we're still married and we're actually happy. We actually have a good relationship. More couples and more women need help with this. And um, so I really felt a calling to kind of offer that the insight that I felt like I was missing for so long on how do you make that shift from, you know, feeling frustrated and having a lot of conflict to really working together as a team and getting past some of these, you know, cultural norms of what's expected of men and women and creating a more collaborative, effective and, and friendly partnership. Okay. I like that. I like that. And I appreciate you sharing your backstory. So many lessons there and relatable points. I'm in the South, the Bible Belt. And, you know, we've got a lot of those traditional role type of attitudes, even to this day, which I'll, I have a question for you later, but I, I may have missed it. Are you actually, you and your husband Mormon or are you just influenced by being in that community? Yeah. So we both have Mormon backgrounds. I was raised in a much more, I would say, traditional Mormon home than my mm-hmm. husband. And I still do participate in the LDS church. My husband is not actively participating in the, in the LDS church now. So we kind of have that, that difference as well. But okay. yeah. Okay. I, in follow-up to what you just shared, appreciate the uh, transparency. And I, I'd like to start there. And I appreciate what first you answering a question you've been asked a lot, but I like to start from the beginning so people can relate and know that you didn't just read this in a book or go right. to some online course. You have It's a lived experience. And what you're sharing are things that you know work for a fact. In regards to us working so hard outside of the home, most most couples now, you know, both partners are working, but I'm sure you're familiar with the term the second shift for women, yes. referring to the unpaid labor, six-figure labor. It's been calculated 
that women in particular do at home after their paid work day. And this is not just a baby boomer problem, my generation and older. I've observed this phenomenon very recently among millennials and Gen Z couples. How should women advocate for more partnership and challenge rid gender roles. I mean, we want to show respect for our spouse, but also, like you were saying, it, it's exhausting. You know, you've got two full-time jobs that you're expected to do based on societal norms where women didn't work. That's the part I can't get <laughs> some guys to understand. Your mother didn't work. Your grandmother didn't right. work outside the home because right. homemaking is a hell of a job. It's, it's much harder than going outside the home. But again, how do we advocate for that you know, therapy is, is one option, but how do we challenge those gender roles? Yeah, well, I think it it helps to kind of, you know, to take the, the kind of the blame and shame away from it. Mm -hmm. And it's not just like an individual problem for us as a couple. It's a cultural yeah. norm. And I think, you know, that was something that I was really struggling with early on. Like I was blaming my husband. For this huge cultural problem, I was like, why doesn't he get it? And it's like, right. well, of course he, he sees things the way that he sees them based mm -hmm. on, you know, how he was raised specifically in his family and then also the broader culture. So to kind of take it away and, and not personalize it so much, I think is really helpful. Like I really took it personally for a long time. Like, oh, he personally doesn't value me and that's why he's not being the partner that I would like him to be and so that I think it helps to kind of just remove and depersonalize it a little bit like of course this is kind of the cultural template that we've inherited right. so of course things are working the way that they are and then one of the things I talk about you know no matter what the challenge is that we have in our relationship if we can think about Rather than just what are the complaints I have, what's wrong with what's going on now, it's what do I really want this to look like? What do I want this relationship to look like? And what is the, you know, I say kind of like the positive future, our vision for the future. And you can really have much more productive conversations with your spouse or partner if you talk about what do we want this to look like? rather than what's wrong with how things are now. Because I okay. do believe that most men want to see themselves as an active and engaged partner in the home. Mm -hmm. um, and, and most of them probably look at their parents also and think, you know what, there are things, the ways some of my, some of the things my parents did, I want to do differently. Mm -hmm. And so we can engage them in that way of what do we want this to look like? rather than just the, the laundry list of complaints about how things are not working right now. That's a helpful um, framework, I think. The other thing that I think is really valuable and helpful is to kind of shift the mindset away from paid work being more highly valued than unpaid work. Right. Um, and I think, you know, that is the part where we, we are kind of as women challenging the uh, the traditional masculine idea that that paid work is more valuable. You know, I recently was um, interacting with someone online. They were talking about their husband said, "Well, I make so much money; it doesn't make sense for me to do dishes." Oh my goodness! Wow. And it's like, well, <laughs> who's going to do the dishes then? Like. Wow. Is my time not valued as much as yours? Is the, is the time of the person who does the dishes not valued as much as yours because you make so much money? And I think, you know, my first reaction is, is anger to that idea, mm -hmm. but to have some compassion, like, oh, we have been taught in our society that the more you get paid, the more valuable your time right. is. Um, so we can challenge that idea and, and we probably have to do it with, a little bit of courage, but also a little bit of humility as well as, oh, where did that idea come from? Right, right. It's not that this individual person is a complete asshole, that that's what they've been taught. And so, it's constantly reinforced as well. Even now, the movies I watch, 
the videos, you know, whether it's guys, you know, praying money on, <laughs> on women making it rain or just yeah. conversations in the locker room. And so even though I can see that, you know, even though we're trying at home to have meaningful conversations and get understanding when they're in, inundated, you know, with these stereotypical role and role models and jokes and thoughts from everywhere. It, it's just a constant, just a constant battle, I guess I want to say. Yeah. Yeah. And well, like you said, you know, these millennials and Gen Z's, I, I think we've always had this idea that the younger cultures are becoming more progressive, but I think, and I think they are in some ways, the, the younger generations, but I think also there's kind of this pushback. There's that kind of, you know, manosphere of, oh, I don't like the way things are going. I don't, I don't yeah. like this disempowered feeling that this, you know, this new cultural shift mm-hmm. is making me feel. And so I'm going to push back and, and reexert that idea of male dominance. So we are, we're seeing that in our culture. Yeah. We're seeing the two kind of forces pushing back and forth against each other. Yeah. Yeah. Well, in the, in these conversations, and it has to be an ongoing dialogue, just like anything else when you're changing the habits of generations, passed down from generation to generation. Cause sometimes I even hear dads saying things like, are you going to let her talk to you like that? Or you, you know, yeah. she's not fixing your plate. Even if it's said jokingly, it's just like, okay, you know, she's emasculating you because she won't fix your plate. So. Yeah. <laughs> As we try to express ourselves like you did, you know, that seems like more work or whatever. We have, most of us have different ways of expressing emotions than men. So when we present a problem or a concern, we often get accused of being whiny or bitchy or whiny bitches, whatever. How, how do we express real needs without being perceived as weak or needy? Yeah. Well, and I think I thought that that was kind of an interesting way that you brought it up. I think um, the best tip that I have is to shift from a complaint to a request. The other thing I wanted to say is how someone else perceives that is somewhat out of our control. Mm -hmm. So the best thing we can do is to, you know, to be as clean and and straightforward on our end as we can be and kind of let go of how other people perceive that. But when you shift from a complaint to a request rather than, and this of course is something that I did wrong for so long, rather than being like, ah, I'm so overwhelmed. I'm doing everything at home. I, I just can't keep up all, with all of that and hoping that our partner's going to fill in the blanks and say, Oh, Obviously, I need I got help you. more <laughs> yeah, I got to you. say, I got you. You know, that's kind of our fantasy is to be like, I really want to talk about how, you know, what all of our responsibilities are and how we can be more successful in the future in making sure that everything gets done in a really fair and collaborative way. Can we mm-hmm. talk about that? Mm-hmm. Um, I was just telling, I was just on another podcast and I was talking about how my kids are just getting back in school right now and they're eight and nine. So they're starting to get old enough to help a little bit more. Yay. And (laughs) I know, and I was like, this transition, I think that transitions are the perfect opportunity to start talking about this because it's like, you know what? The way things have been going has, has been fine. We've been doing okay. I'd like to talk about how we can do it better in this next season of our life. It's a great opportunity to kind of start having some of those collaborative conversations and kind of from a point of not like I've been resenting you for so long and now it's my chance to get back, but no, Mm -hmm. let's just talk about the future and how we can do better. You know, the kids are getting back in school. I'd like them to help more with chores, but they're they're not just going to be completely independent in this way. Mm -hmm. So what, what can we do to kind of make this next season of our life run really smoothly and, and all feel successful? And I know it sounds, if you're in the middle of this struggle, this sounds completely impossible to do, but that is like an opportunity of 
let's talk about a more positive future. I'm going to kind of let go of some of the resentment I have about how things have gone in the past and have a more hopeful and optimistic approach to the future. Yeah. Nice. Nice. And, and I know this is critical. I went through this myself. I was married 17 years and um, words, you know, words matter and how you present it, your emotions when you do so, so that it's received. So isn't it important though, that when you want to have this conversation that you don't just spring it on your partner? The, oh, for sure. You know, cause we tend to do it out of frustration and start just yelling about whatever that thing is that just happened instead right. of calming down, even setting up an appointment. I'd like to talk with you about this at some time because men from my, I've got two sons, nine uncles, my dad, all of that. When you say we need to talk, you know, <laughs> that triggers all oh, kind of for sure. Parts. It's like, oh yeah. yeah, I think men have kind of, and you know, again, it's, it's not anything like personal or individual. It's kind of just this whole culture. Like men have this, generally have this knee-jerk reaction of we need to talk is like oh no what am i in trouble right i did something wrong what's gonna happen so even like hey i'd like to talk about how we can be more successful in this way um men in general they love hearing about how they can be successful Mm -hmm. that's that's good phrasing i like that they love hearing that and they love knowing that you know if you guys can talk about something and negotiate and come up with a plan and then they can follow through on that plan and, and get acknowledged and appreciated for that. And I'm, that I, I really want <laughs> to just also point out that this doesn't mean you have to be like giving undeserved praise or anything like that, which is, I think some of the advice that we get as women often, but no, if we can start to make a plan and kind of, incrementally work on some of these things that have been pain points in our relationship and do it, you know, with some compassion and understanding that change is hard and we have natural resistance to change. Both of us do, but just be like positive and optimistic and hopeful. Mm -hmm. Um, We really can, you know, it's not going to happen overnight, but we can incrementally start to improve our relationship. And when we do it in a way that our partners are feeling successful, then they're more likely to give us more. You know, my my mentor, Terry Real, will often say an empowered partner is a generous partner. Mm. Like when they feel like they have a clear idea of how to be successful and that they're appreciated, of course, they're going to want to keep doing what they're doing when they feel like nothing they ever do is good enough, then of course they're not going to feel very generous. Right. It's the right. same for us as women. No, nobody wants to be just all the time. Nothing's right. A complaint, a complaint, a complaint. Because even me at some point, and I think for us, it tends to happen more in business, you know, in those roles. But at some point, you know, you go to quiet quitting. I'm not even trying. I can't please you. Right. Nothing I do pleases you. So why would I even try? I'm I'm just here. I'm a placeholder. Yeah. So, and that's not a fun feeling at all. No. At no, all. And of course, that's not what we want for our marriage or other intimate relationships. Yeah. Yeah. A lot more gratitude. I like what you said about that too, celebrating when the partner does do something that you discuss, you know, there's buy-in. And also to let them know in advance what the talk is going to be about so that they don't have that fear and and dread is I want to talk about how we can be more successful. Hey, I'm in for that conversation. When? Let's do it. Because typically, and I know you you, uh, counsel couples and individuals, but typically when they have buy-in and they're part of the conversation as opposed to being attacked, uh, aren't they excited? It just as excited about it as the woman? I, yeah, definitely. I think, you know, when I work with couples, especially, I think women are often surprised at how willing their spouses are to show up for them when it's, when it's phrased in this way of mm-hmm. how can we be successful as a couple? It's so much better than 
how can I get you off my back? Right, right. And ultimatums, if you don't do this, I'm out of here. But it, it's right. learning for all of us and growth because we think a lot of us are just parroting what we parroting what we saw role model because our mothers didn't know our grandmothers didn't know. So it was yell, scream and cry because at least they got me some attention Right. <laughs> if you weren't yeah. listening, but the results are, are not always that great. For sure. So this is, this is good stuff. What are, and we may have touched on all of them, but are there any other common mistakes that uh, partners make when trying to improve their relationship with a significant other? Yeah, I think the, the main thing, this comes up a lot, um, you know, in the groups and the, the individuals that I coach is this idea that we're going to have one conversation, we're going to kind of <laughs> set the record straight, and then everything's going to just magically change from there. Mm. And I really encourage people to treat it as kind of this ongoing iterative process, like we're probably going to be talking about how things are going in our relationship at least once a week, right? That's, mm-hmm. that's a, a realistic expectation and you can do it. I think when you're starting out, you can do it in kind of a more scripted way. You know, you can have some sort of a, a format of how you do it and how you check in with each other. And then over time, it can become a little bit more organic and natural. I think expecting that is helpful. Um, you know, one of the things that I share with my, my couples and, you know, usually the women are the ones who have more desire for change from the get go is think about like 50%, 50%, you know, if you make a plan, I recently had a couple who they were making a plan for the morning because they have babies and they both have work. And so what, what do we want our morning to look like? Let's make a plan and detail exactly, you know, what expectations and plans are. And right. then I told the wife, okay, if this goes 70% well, 70% of the time, I want you to consider that a success. Hey, that's a C. It's passing. <laughs> Rather than what we do, I think especially those of us who are like really strong, independent, capable mm-hmm. women. We're like, well, I've been doing this 100% well, 100% on my own, thinking that when we sit down and make a plan with our spouse, that that's going to now all of a sudden it's going to be balanced and equal and mm-hmm. 100% compliance. And that's just not the way it works. So let's start out. Let's, you know, work on this for a few weeks and then regroup and talk about how's it going? How can I help you be more successful? Mm. Not in like a patronizing way or anything, but in a, we're both adults here and we're trying to do something different than we've ever done before. And it's not going to go seamlessly. Mm -hmm. We're going to check in with each other. And another thing that, that we as women, I'm talking to myself as much as anyone else, we've got to be willing to accept feedback. Yes from our partners as much as we're willing to give it. Yes. And that's hard for us. Yeah. Cause we don't, we don't always see that coming when we set up these conversations, we're thinking of a monologue and, and then it's like, right. Oh, you so know, we're gonna, talking about this. Yeah, I want you to act like an adult, but I also want to give you a tour chart as if you're a child. <laughs> right. And it's, yeah, I mean, like we, we should have a lot of compassion for ourselves. Mm hmm. And our partners as we're going through this, because like we've said, this is a totally new frontier for most of us to, yeah. to stand, you know, nose to nose as if we're equals with our partners. Mm-hmm. Most of us haven't been, you know, there's been a lot of kind of control and manipulation modeled for us in relationships. And we're unlearning a lot of that right. as we're trying to do things differently. Mm. Good, good stuff. And I, a little tip I got from some uh, counseling and therapy. I'm a talker. That's why I'm a podcast host and writer and speaker <laughs> coach because I'm a talker. I love words. I can just go on and on and on. But I was also talking over my significant other, interrupting, not letting them get a word in. And I think that's, you know, not specific to me i think that's something we do especially when we're riled up so Mm -hmm. this particular counselor coach uh introduced the talking stick although i think we use just some kind of little object 
And when I didn't have it, you know, it, it took a lot of practice. It was hard, but I needed to listen and not talk. So I'll throw that out there for someone who may be like me and just anxious to express every thought is that part of this is, is as you said, being able to receive constructive feedback about you and your behavior or their thoughts about what you just said without interrupting over and over again. Yeah, it takes a lot of humility. Mm -hmm. I think, you know, one of the things I talk about often is, you know, the humility and courage, both of those things, you know, it takes a lot of courage to speak up. It takes a lot of courage to be more vulnerable, you know, to make a request instead of complain. Um, it's a lot more vulnerable, mm-hmm. but then the humility part is like receiving some feedback. How is all of this coming across to you? And and really considering that and not letting, you know, not going into that one up grandiose position of, well, I know better than you, but right. also not going down into that, you know, kind of the the traditional feminine submissive role of how can I get you to love me, you know? It takes a lot of maturity to get to that more equal footing with each other. I understand. I had a little interruption there. My apologies. But yes, no, you're good. the equal footing to be understood. Uh, yeah. Podcasting on location. Things happen, folks. The <laughs> real world. So, Sharon, you have given some wonderful tips and strategies. I mean, just first steps to get folks started and eliminate some of the frustration of trying to have a more equitable, connected relationship. And I'm really excited. I wish we could go on with this conversation, but our time is coming to a close. So please, for those who want to learn more about your services, you offer couples and individuals and also how to find your website and podcast online. Would you share that information with us? Yeah. So I, I do have a podcast. It's called Respected and Connected. And you can find that on all of the podcast platforms. And my website is also respectedandconnected.com. You can look and, you know, see more about the services that I offer. I work with individuals and with couples. You can schedule a free consult with me through that website Mm -hmm. and also just check out what else is going on. So I'd love to hear from any of you who this resonates with and you think, oh, maybe I could explore some of that and get some support with what I'm working on in my relationships. I'm definitely here for that. Sweet. And uh, I just love your demeanor and your manner. You're just so, so calm. I feel better. (laughs) (laughs) I haven't always felt calm, uh, but it's been, it's been a privilege to be able to offer that to people, you know, it's kind of, let's get back recentered and, and think about this. Um, from that place of calmness and grounded and and confidence, because that's where we really can be more effective and successful and and connected as well. Absolutely, that's a powerful place. Thank you so much, Sharon. It's it's been a great pleasure, and thank you, listeners, for your time and support of this woman-owned indie podcast. We've got two indie podcasters here. Remember to like, subscribe, and share for more like this. Until next time, be safe and be well. Thank you. And wasn't that a great program? Oh, love that episode. I enjoyed it. I hope you did too. Please remember to like, subscribe, and share. Learn more about me on my website, drmoanderson.com. That's M-O-E. You can read book excerpts, watch videos, learn about my services that I offer, and book me for a speaking engagement. I'd love to talk with your group. And I'd love to work with you. So until the next time, review, renew, and re-you. Thank you.